The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Well, when it comes to machine learning, it's a jungle out there. And it's interesting that if you buy two books in machine learning and you look at them, you will feel that you are reading about two completely different subjects. If one of them is theoretical and particular theories, there are a bunch of theories, and one of them is practical, or one of them is uh, uh, emphasizing a particular technique, they just have nothing in common, not even the jargon, okay? So if you go out on your own and just look at what happens in machine learning, pretty much this is the picture you will get. Okay. Not a pretty picture, okay? And you can see buzzwords galore, and you know people will get excited about one thing and tell you that this is you know God's gift to humanity, and you know the other thing you know, people will be very opinionated. It's just all over the place. So I'm not going to attempt to be complete, okay? Because being complete here is fatal. Trying to cover everything so that everybody is happy that you covered the, the, the results they got. I don't think this is a good strategy. I, I sort of, uh, uh, I preached the, the Occam's razor last time. Remember Occam's razor? Okay, you should have a razor, and then you should trim, 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 until you get the essential part. This is pretty much what I try to do here, okay? Because I believe that if you understand the fundamentals inside out, you can pursue things completely on your own, okay, from then on. You are not going to be intimidated by, you know, by you know, grandiose statements or, you know, of, of one nature or another. You will know where things lie and what not. So my task was to get the foundation right, okay? And in the course of doing that, I had to omit many, many topics, okay? So now I'm going to give you the map of the whole thing, wh what we covered and what can be pursued in order just to, to, to have a, a good outlook on the situation. Okay, so here is the map. There is theory, okay? And theory means that you mathematically model what happens in reality, and then try to, to do mathematical derivation in order to arrive at results that are not otherwise obvious. That's what theory is in general, okay? And there are usually two aspects when you look at a theory. What assumptions they made, and then what the derivation is in order to get to the results. I hardly ever saw a situation where there is a problem with the second part. People are very competent mathematicians. They are not going to make a mistake in derivation. So the chances are they will, uh, when they make a statement mathematically, they actually mean it and they proved it. So that is not our concern. The biggest pitfall in theory is that people make assumptions that make what they are solving really divorced from the, the practice that you are going to see when you use machine learning, okay? And when I picked the theory, I picked it with a view to relevance to practice. I wanted to get something, it has to obviously be mathematics and, and, and it has to be proved and all of that, but then when you see the result, you can, you can use it. And I will go through you know, other alternatives that have succeeded in that to different degrees. Then there are techniques, and that is really the bulk of machine learning, okay? We covered some techniques, but I'm going to categorize techniques into two sets and give you samples, and then you'll understand from what we have done where it, where it lies and how you can pursue it further. And finally, there are paradigms. And paradigms meaning different assumptions about the learning situation, not, not mathematical assumptions, but different assumptions that deal with different learning situations, like for example, supervised learning versus reinforcement learning and whatnot. And when you make these assumptions, the problems you are solving are sufficiently different that you end up with really a different body of knowledge that you have to study, and therefore we call them different paradigms. So these are basically the categories. So let me start with the paradigms first because it's the higher level and then go to the other ones. Okay, so we covered supervised learning. That was almost the exclusive topic of the course and it is by far the most popular and the most useful form of machine learning. So if you cover just that, you are already very much ahead. The other topics are interesting and they have applications and they should be studied, okay? but definitely not in the league of supervised learning in terms of impact on practice. We touched on unsupervised learning with a single algorithm we had, but we at least got the idea that you know, clustering is the key and indeed clustering is the key. And with unsupervised, there are also variations of that. There are semi-supervised and there are, you know, there are every, everything I say here has a bunch of variations already there. So I'm just giving you the center of mass of these paradigms. 
Then there is reinforcement learning that I described in the first lecture very briefly, but we didn't cover at all. And the reason is, 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 uh, is justified because the main problem in supervised learning was the question of information. Do I have enough information in the data in order to get the target function and generalize, right? When you go to reinforcement learning, remember what reinforcement learning was. You, you don't have the target value on the examples. You just take an action, okay, which is an output, not necessarily the target output. And then something comes that tells you that you did well or you didn't do well. So the uh, sort of reinforcement of good uh, 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 actions and uh, elimination of bad actions make you, uh, will, will make you eventually converge to a good solution. And we said that it applies to games. Let's say you're playing, you know, trying to, to learn backgammon. And what you do, you just play against yourself, generating at will examples as you want. Here's a situation, what do I do? I'll do something, I can generate that. The only question is, after you do that, how do you take the feedback of winning and losing and go back and adjust your strategy such that you converge to a good strategy? So the issue here is completely different from supervised learning. It's not a question of information, it's a question of the algorithm that will take all of these tons of examples that you can generate at will and produce a, a way to converge to a solution from one strategy to a better strategy to a better strategy. So it's a completely different paradigm. And if there is one topic in this entire uh, uh, view graph that I would encourage you to pursue would be read about reinforcement learning. It's a very sweet subject, okay? Finally, there are many paradigms, active learning. So active learning, it could be active reinforcement or active supervised. It, active learning means that instead of someone giving you the data set, you query about the, the value at a particular point. So you give me the input and you ask for the output if it's supervised, or you give me the input and expect a reward or punishment if it's reinforcement learning, okay? So it's an adjustment and there are some interesting results there. And the other sort of mini paradigm is online learning, in, and this is purely computational consideration, okay? So take any form of, of, of learning and instead of giving you the full data set and allowing you to work with it any way you want, I am giving, I'm streaming the data set to you. So you take something and you try to, you know, modify your, your current hypothesis, and then you take the other guy, and you cannot store everything. If you could store everything, you have the whole data set. So there are limitations on storage and computation, and under those constraints, you ask yourself, you know, how can I learn, and you know, how close can I get to the optimal as if I had the whole data set, and whatnot. Okay, so these are the most famous paradigms. There are other paradigms. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. Now let's go for the theory. Okay, the main theory in machine learning is the vapnik shervonenkis theory, and it is the one that I covered in great detail in this course, as you realized, okay? And the reason is very, is, 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 you know, very straightforward. It's relevant, okay? You do the math, you go through the proofs, and then you get the VC dimension, you equate it to the number of parameters in some cases, and when you go to practice, even if you are taking bounds and treating them as if they were equalities, that leap of faith works very well in practice. So it's not that the, you know, the, 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 the theory was there and we decided that this is a good one. The theory was there and then we tried to take wisdom from the theory and apply it in practice and it worked. This is the value added by choosing a topic and putting it here. You know that there is a reason why it's here and the reason here is that it is actually relevant to practice. Then there is the bias variance. Well, bias variance sort of a sweet little theory and it gave us some intuition about this. And indeed, it was included, it was sort of low cost to include it, and it does lead to some understandings like the learning curves and whatnot. There are theories that I didn't uh, describe, although that they are very substantial in the literature. One of them is based on computational complexity. They, it basically treats machine learning as a branch of computational complexity with an emphasis on asymptotic results. So there's a question of, you know, can I do this in polynomial time or not? And it's a very respectable uh, 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 body of work. And the, the only question for including it or not including it is whether these particular results correspond to something that I, I face in practice, okay? So when I look at it, should I, should I do the, the computational complexity part of it or should I do the generalization part of it? The generalization part of it, one hands down because it's the one that is the bottleneck when I practice machine learning. And finally, this is the, there is the famous Bayesian approach. Now this treats machine learning as a branch of probability, okay? So you have a problem, we can always put a probability distribution, and by the time you put the full joint probability distribution, you can answer all questions, okay? And it's a very sweet theory because you, you, can, you can sort of ask any question you want 
and you will find a very concrete, rigorous mathematical answer to that question if you have the, 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 the setup of the joint probability distribution. Okay? Okay, so now let's go for the techniques. I mean, there are other theories again. I just give you the sort of the, the biggest players. When you look at techniques, you should separate models, as in hypothesis sets and algorithms that go with them. That's one category. And then the high level methods like regularization, for example, that doesn't restrict itself to a particular model, but is superimposed on anything you use. Okay, so I will, will look at, category, at, at members of those categories. So we looked at the models. Linear, we emphasize a lot. It is not usually emphasized in regular machine learning courses. They usually go for, for other models. It's emphasized very much in statistics, for example. And I find it to be very underrepresented in, in, in machine learning. It's a very important model. With the nonlinear transform, you can cover a lot of territory, and it's very low cost, and it should be tried in many le learning problems. Then we went on to neural networks. You have seen that. Support vector machines and the kernel methods. Okay, so we covered quite a bit of territory. Nearest neighbors, I alluded to very quickly when I talked about RBF. It's a very standard method. You know, you know not much to, 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 to say about it, except that it's a good benchmark. That if you have a data set, why don't you categorize everything according to the nearest neighbor? And this will be give you a performance, and then you can compare other methods to, to that. It's uh, you know, not that difficult to implement. We used, looked at RBF and its relation to, 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 to many things in machine learning. And then there is Gaussian processes, which some people are completely fond of, which is great. And it really has the same spirit of, of Bayesian. It's a full probability distribution. So a, 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 a process here means a random process. A random process is nothing but a random function. If a random variable is a random number, a random process is a random function. Okay? So you have probability distribution over different you know, functions that can come out. Okay? And the assumption here is that they are Gaussian, which means that if you take any finite number of points, the, the probability distribution of the Y coordinate is jointly Gaussian for those guys. Okay? So if you have a, a, a full description of that probability distribution, you can so solve anything you want because you can say, okay, if I have this data point, then I am conditioning on that Gaussian variable being equal to that, and I'm asking myself, what is now the conditional distribution of the other guys? And for Gaussian, this is completely solved, and you know, you have nice matrices to just multiply out and get that solution. So it's very good to, to, to use, and if you are modeling something that happens to be a Gaussian process, okay, then obviously you, 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 you win you know, greatly because you are actually matching that, okay? There's SVD, which is the, the singular value decomposition used figuratively in this case. This is the, the, the factor analysis we used in the Netflix problem, where we represented the, the, the user as a bunch of factors and the movie as a bunch of factors, and we try to match. When you put this, you find that it's as if you are decomposing the ratings matrix, the entire rating matrix, into two matrices, and this will be similar to singular value decomposition in mathematics. So we have seen part of that. Finally, there is graphical models, and graphical models is, is almost a different paradigm in its own right. Okay. They're, they're, okay. What are graphical models? They are a model for the, where the target is a joint probability distribution. That's what you are trying to learn. Okay? And the key here is that the joint probability distribution between a very large number of variables becomes very difficult to manage computationally because there is, you know, the number of possibilities would be exponential in the number of variables. So the bulk of work in graphical models is trying to find a simple way or an efficient way in order to get answers about that joint probability distribution and to learn it. So it is mostly computational and it's based on graph algorithms and the, the, the main aspect of, the, of, of putting it in a graph is to use the properties that happen to be conditional independence as a way to simplify the graph. Okay? So, if you look at the things I, I showed so far, probably there would be a full course in graphical models, which is completely justified. If you are in the business of modeling joint probability distributions and computation is a consideration, this is the thing to learn. There is no question about that, okay? It's specialized, but it's very uh, 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 helpful in that case, okay? And the other one I mentioned with reinforcement learning, usually taught together with active learning because there are a there are lot of commonalities. Now we go for the methods, and the methods are very important because they cover a lot of territory regardless of the model you have. We use the regularization. Can you think of other model, other, other methods at the same level that we used? Regularization, and mm, we used validation, right? These were all you know, to, to, to methods overall, okay? There are things we didn't cover, and one of them is aggregation, okay? 
putting together different solutions. And the last one we didn't cover was input processing. This is something you do regardless of the model you are going to use. And I find that input processing is best uh, taught within uh, a project's course. It's a very practical matter. And when you teach a project's course and people will have to deal with the real data, it's a good thing to start by telling them, okay, here is the principal component analysis in order to you know, normalize and decorrelate the inputs and whatnot, and this is the value, and then they can try it. There is sort of little intellectual value to input processing. It's a practical matter, and therefore it is best taught when you are teaching a practical course. 